Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the Scriptures. We sure love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for October 23rd through 29th, 2023. This is covering First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the Scriptures. Oh, I'm so excited to have you here, Scriptures. It's so great to see you. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 40 minutes, 32 seconds. Oh, that's one of our long ones. But what would that be daily? 5 minutes, 47 seconds. Yeah, see, that's not a problem. We can do it. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it chapter by chapter, book by book, or buckle up and we'll talk about them all together. So let's get started with 1 Timothy. Let's take an introduction from the 2016 Seminary Manual. It says, Paul wrote this epistle to Timothy, who had served with Paul during his second missionary journey. Following their mission, Timothy continued to be a faithful missionary and church leader and one of Paul's most trusted associates. Paul referred to Timothy as his own son in the faith. Timothy's father was a Greek Gentile, but he had a righteous Jewish mother and grandmother who had taught him and helped him learn the scriptures. Paul's first epistle to Timothy was likely written sometime between A.D. 64 and 65, possibly while Paul was in Macedonia. Before writing this epistle, Paul had been released from his two-year imprisonment, or house arrest, in Rome and was likely traveling widely, visiting regions where he had previously established branches of the church. At the time this epistle was written, Timothy was serving as a church leader in Ephesus. Paul hinted that some members doubted Timothy's leadership abilities because he was young. Paul intended to visit Timothy in person, but he was unsure whether he would be able to do so. Paul wrote his epistle to Timothy to help the young church leader better understand his duties. And so with that, let's start with 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables, or false teachings, and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do Now, heeding endless genealogies refers to the false tradition that salvation came only to those of the chosen seed of Abraham, who were often known by their lengthy or endless genealogies. Right. Now, going on in verse 5, Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. The footnote says, pointless discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. The Institute Manual tells us Paul warned that these activities, like vain janglings, distract believers from the truth and generate strife and contention. In these latter days, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that the church is to teach God's truths. Quote, In God's church, the only approved doctrine is God's doctrine. The church is not a debating society. It is not searching for a system of salvation. It is not a forum for social or political philosophies. It is, rather, the Lord's kingdom with a commission to teach his truths for the salvation of men. End quote. Great. So, Paul is teaching Timothy that priesthood leaders have the responsibility to ensure that true doctrine and correct principles are taught. The 2016 Seminary Manual includes this quote from President Thomas S. Monson. This comes from a worldwide leadership training meeting in November of 2010. He says, quote, I'm reminded of an experience I had many years ago when I served as a bishop. During the opening exercises of our priesthood meeting one Sunday morning, we were preparing to ordain a young man to the office of priest. Visiting our ward that day was a high counselor who served as a temple worker. As I prepared to have the young man sit down to face the congregation so that we could proceed with the ordination, the high counselor stopped me and said, Bishop, 
I always have those being ordained turned to face the temple. He repositioned the chair so that the young man would be facing in the direction of the temple. I immediately recognized an unauthorized practice. I could see the potential for it to become more widespread in practice. Although much younger than the high counselor, I knew what needed to be done. I turned the chair back so that it was again facing the congregation and said to him, In our ward, we face the congregation. End quote. Wow. President Monson doesn't inform us how this went over with the high counselor. I hope the well-meaning stake officer recognized what was happening. I wish there was some way we could know what the correct procedures are for practices in the church. Oh, wait, we do. That's right. That We have a very lengthy general handbook of instructions. Now, after these remarks, President Monson goes on to list a few of the many localized detours in church practice from leaders that they've had to deal with over the years and tells his audience that they could have all been avoided if leaders would just read that handbook. Now, in verses 8 through 11, Paul warned against those who desired to be teachers of God's law, but did not have a correct understanding of it. Let's pick it up in verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. The Institute Manual adds, Paul referred to the sins he had committed before his conversion, and he taught that he had obtained mercy from Jesus Christ because he had acted in ignorance. One of the gospel's great eternal truths is that the Lord will not hold anyone accountable for sins committed in ignorance. And that's wonderful. Let's keep going in verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The Institute Manual mentions, Paul taught that he was a pattern or example to others of the power of the Savior's grace. Mercy and grace are gifts the Lord gives to those who, in their weakness, are striving to be holy. As in Paul's case, mercy allows us to repent, which in turn brings more mercy to us. In verses 17 through 19, Paul counsels Timothy to hold to his faith, to war a good warfare against sin, like it says in verse 17. Then he contrasts him against other leaders whom Paul seems to have excommunicated or delivered unto Satan, as it says in verse 19. And that brings us to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Here, Paul taught that Jesus Christ is our mediator, and he counseled church members regarding how to conduct themselves. Let's highlight a sample of those verses. The Institute Manual tells us, Paul declared in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, that Jesus Christ is our mediator with God. A mediator is one who intervenes between two parties, usually to restore peace and friendship. The Joseph Smith translation provides the insight that Jesus Christ was ordained to be a mediator between God and man. Because he took our sins upon himself, Jesus Christ can redeem us and reconcile our relationship with the Father, allowing us to return to his presence. Restored scripture attests that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He justifies men and women and then perfects them. And hallelujah for that. Let's keep going in verse 9. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but, which becometh women professing godliness, with good works. The Institute Manual adds, Paul encouraged women to adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety meaning with humility and reverence. He also taught that women should avoid costly clothing and jewelry and ornate grooming. 
Similar teachings are found in 1 Nephi 13, 4 Nephi, Mormon chapter 8, and Doctrine and Covenants section 42. Paul indicated that women should dress as those professing godliness. The principle of wearing modest clothing applies to both male and female members of the church today. Quote, Through your dress and appearance, you can show that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and that you love him. Prophets of God have continually counseled his children to dress modestly. When you are well-groomed and modestly dressed, you invite the companionship of the Spirit, and you can be a good influence on others. End quote. That's from the 2011 For the Strength of Youth booklet. Thank you. Also, President Russell M. Nelson in the October 2020 General Conference said, quote, When your greatest desire is to let God prevail, to be part of Israel— so many decisions become easier. So many issues become non-issues. You know how best to groom yourself. You know the kind of person you really want to become. Close quote. I like that. The Institute Manual also adds, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul said, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach. Some people have taken these verses to mean that women were not allowed to speak in church in Paul's day. However, his recommendation that women learn in silence may have been an effort to correct a specific problem where some women were usurping the authority of church leaders. Yeah, we talked about this subject in more detail in episode 36 for 1 Corinthians 14, so we recommend that you review that for more resources on the subject. But for our purposes here, let's share a quote from President M. Russell Ballard. This is from an Enzyme article called Women of Righteousness in the April 2002 Enzyme. He says, quote, Every sister in this church who has made covenants with the Lord has a divine mandate to help save souls, to lead the women of the world, to strengthen the homes of Zion, and to build the kingdom of God. Sister Eliza R. Snow, the second general president of the Relief Society, said that every sister in this church should be a preacher of righteousness because we have greater and higher privileges than any other females upon the face of the earth. Close quote. Nice. Let's take a look at chapter 2, verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, the Institute Manual says Paul wrote that Eve transgressed because she was deceived. This was a reference to the fact that Eve was the first to partake of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Rather than being criticized, Eve should be honored for her bold willingness to initiate mortality for all humankind. The Greek text of 1 Timothy 2, verse 14 suggests that Paul believed Eve's transgression consisted in her overstepping her bounds by usurping authority to make a decision that affected both herself and Adam. The Greek word parabasis, translated in these verses as transgression, means literally to overstep. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency discussed Eve's decision to eat the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Quote, It was Eve who first transgressed the limits of Eden in order to initiate the conditions of mortality. Her act, whatever its nature, was formally a transgression, but eternally a glorious necessity to open the doorway toward eternal life. Adam showed his wisdom by doing the same, and thus... Eve and Adam fell that men might be. Some Christians condemn Eve for her act, concluding that she and her daughters are somehow flawed by it. Not the Latter-day Saints. Informed by revelation, we celebrate Eve's act and honor her wisdom and courage in the great episode called The Fall. Joseph Smith taught that it was not a sin because God had decreed it. Modern revelation shows that our first parents understood the necessity of the fall. Adam declared, Blessed be the name of God, for because of my transgression, my eyes are opened, and in this life I shall have joy, and again in the flesh I shall see God. Note the different perspective and the special wisdom of Eve, who focused on the purpose and effect of the great plan of happiness. 
Were it not for our transgression, we never should have had seed, and never should have known good and evil, and the joy of our redemption, and the eternal life which God giveth unto all the obedient. In his vision of the redemption of the dead, President Joseph F. Smith saw the great and mighty ones assembled to meet the Son of God, and among them was our glorious Mother Eve. Close quote. That's from a landmark talk called The Great Plan of Happiness from the October 1993 General Conference. That's a great one. And that brings us to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Here, Paul also set forth qualifications for bishops and deacons. As you study those verses, consider how these characteristics remind you of Jesus Christ. Starting in verse 1, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, as you study... Consider how having these attributes would allow a bishop to help you like the Savior would. In verses 8 through 13, Paul describes the role of deacons. The Institute Manual says, The word deacon comes from a Greek word, meaning servant or minister. The office of deacon seems to have been a preparatory one, because Paul did not prohibit a novice, or recent convert, from being called as a deacon, but did prohibit a novice from being called as a bishop, like it says in verse 6. Other requirements for deacons were similar to those for bishops, including the requirement that deacons be the husbands of one wife. And that brings us to 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verses 1 through 11, Paul prophesied that in the latter times, as it mentions in verse 1, some church members would depart from the faith and follow false teachings and practices, such as forbidding to marry, as it mentions in verse 3. Paul exhorted Timothy to nourish the saints with true doctrine. Let's pick it up in verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, or check the footnote, conduct or behavior, back to the verse, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So why is it so important to the Lord that we be different from the world? There is no way we can be a light to the world, as Jesus instructed during his Sermon on the Mount, unless we shine forth his pure light. To do that, We need to be an example of his divine traits. Let's pick it up in verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Check your footnote. That means elders. Going on. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. In other words, that Christ's light will shine forth for all to see. Going on with verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Wonderful. This brings us to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, Paul instructed Timothy about how the saints were to care for those in need, including widows. Let's take a look at some commentary from the Institute Manual. It says, In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1-16, through 16, Paul taught true principles about welfare assistance. Respect and concern for the elderly and widows is a godly principle. And although Paul's instructions in these verses applied specifically to widows, many of the principles can be applied more broadly in our day to caring for family members and others in need. 
For example, Paul taught that a widow could qualify for welfare assistance only if she was righteous and did not have children or other relatives who could care for her. If family members would assist widows, the church could avoid becoming burdened down. The reference in 1 Timothy 5.9 to widows being taken into the number may mean that certain widows were numbered among those receiving welfare assistance from the church. Paul then wrote that if any provide not for his own, and specifically for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, referencing here verse 8. The role of fathers to provide temporally for their families was important in Paul's day, as it is today. President Gordon B. Hinckley said, quote, From the early days of this church, husbands have been considered the breadwinners of the family. I believe that no man can be considered a member in good standing who refuses to work to support his family if he is physically able to do so. Close quote. That's from the April 2006 General Conference. Going back to the Institute Manual, although fathers are considered responsible to provide for their families, modern prophets have also taught that families' individual circumstances may necessitate individual adaptation. Here they're quoting the document, The Family, A Proclamation to the World. That's awesome. And that brings us to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's take a look at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The 2016 Seminary Manual includes this great quote from Elder Dallin H. Oaks from the October 1985 General Conference. He says, quote, There is nothing inherently evil about money. The Good Samaritan used the same coinage to serve his fellow man that Judas used to betray the master. It is the love of money which is the root of all evil. The critical difference is the degree of spirituality we exercise in viewing evaluating, and managing the things of this world, close quote. But what should we do with the riches we have been blessed with? Let's take a look at verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Skipping to verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So, if we trust in the living God and are rich in good works, then we can lay hold on eternal life. That is the solid foundation. And it's interesting that Paul doesn't specify that those who are rich in this world should no longer be rich. Right. He simply gave them instruction on what to do with those riches, to lay up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Really great. Now, a quick note on verse 20 might be in order. The Institute Manual clarifies, Paul told Timothy to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science. In this verse, science is a translation of the Greek term nosios, which means knowledge, and the term was probably referring specifically to the Gnostic movement that was then finding its way into early Christianity. Gnostics believed that salvation was obtained by being instructed in secret knowledge called gnosis. Gnosticism was a major source of controversy in 2nd century Christianity. And this brings us to 2 Timothy. Let's take our introduction from the 2016 Seminary Manual. It says, Paul's second epistle to Timothy was likely written sometime between A.D. 64 and 65. 
Paul wrote the epistle during his second imprisonment in Rome shortly before his martyrdom. During his imprisonment, Paul was in chains. He was likely in a cell or dungeon and exposed to the elements, and his friends struggled to locate him. Luke was apparently his only regular visitor, and Paul expected that his life was coming to an end. In this letter, Paul encouraged Timothy and offered strength to help him carry on after Paul's impending death. Paul was aware that his time was short, and he desired to see Timothy, whom Paul figuratively called, My dearly beloved son. At the end of his letter, Paul requested that Timothy and Mark visit him and bring him a few items that he had left behind. Although Paul's letter was addressed specifically to Timothy, its counsel can be applied to those who live in the last days, because Paul taught of challenges and solutions that are relevant to our day as well as his. So let's start with 2 Timothy chapter 1. In the first five verses, Paul expressed his desire to see Timothy and recalled Timothy's sincere faith. Let's pick it up in verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up, check the footnote, or rekindle or revive, the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now the gift of God received by the laying on of hands likely refers to the Holy Ghost. Paul admonished Timothy to rekindle the gift of the Holy Ghost or to earnestly seek to have the Holy Ghost to be with him. Paul teaches us about the contrast between the Spirit of God and that of worldly fear. President Gordon B. Hinckley said, quote, Who among us can say that he or she has not felt fear? I know of no one who has been entirely spared. Some, of course, experience fear to a greater degree than do others. Some are able to rise above it quickly, but others are trapped and pulled down by it and even driven to defeat. We suffer from the fear of ridicule, the fear of failure, the fear of loneliness, the fear of ignorance. Some fear the present, some the future. Some carry the burden of sin and would give almost anything to unshackle themselves from those burdens, but fear to change their lives." This is from an article called, God Hath Not Given Us the Spirit of Fear, in the October 1984 Enzyme. And speaking of that title, let's take a look at verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So Paul testifies that we can overcome worldly fear as we earnestly seek to have the Spirit to be with us. Examine verse 7. How does spiritual power help us overcome fear? How about love? How does that help us overcome fear? Or a sound mind? How does that help us overcome? These are gifts of the Spirit that we can pray for to help us. The term sound mind might not mean much to us today. It's interesting that more modern translations choose a different word. Let's take a look at the NIV for 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Checking the New English translation, it reads, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Those are really good clarifying terms. Now, when each of my kids was young, at one time or another, each of them woke up in the middle of the night having had a scary dream. These experiences were treasures to me, and I remember them fondly. I would take the frightened child into the living room, and we would snuggle together on the couch. During our time together, I shared two scriptures that instantly brought comfort and strength. The first one was 2 Timothy 1.7. I would recite it to the child in my arms, and I could feel them immediately relax. There is real power in that verse. Fear doesn't come from God, and through God, we can access His mighty, loving strength. I then share the story of how Moses accessed that power during a time of great fear when confronting Satan in Moses chapter 1, a story my kids just love. And then I give them a father's blessing. 
These memories are so special for me, and verse 7 is at the heart of them. The Institute Manual has this additional quote from President Thomas S. Monson. This comes from the April 2009 General Conference. He says, quote, It would be easy to become discouraged and cynical about the future, or even fearful of what might come, if we allowed ourselves to dwell only on that which is wrong in the world and in our lives. Today, however, I'd like us to turn our thoughts and our attitudes away from the troubles around us and to focus instead on our blessings as members of the church. The Apostle Paul declared, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The history of the church in this, the dispensation of the fullness of times, is replete with the experiences of those who have struggled and yet who have remained steadfast and of good cheer as they have made the gospel of Jesus Christ the center of their lives. This attitude is what will pull us through whatever comes our way. It will not remove our troubles from us, but rather will enable us to face our challenges, to meet them head on, and to emerge victorious. End quote. Wonderful. Now, in verses 9 through 18, Paul admonished Timothy to remain faithful to true doctrine. Paul also confirmed that widespread apostasy was occurring in the church, like it says in verse 15. And that brings us to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's start in verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul goes on to use the metaphors of a soldier, an athlete, and an husbandman or farmer to teach Timothy how to remain strong in the faith despite hardships. Let's go on with verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness. Check your footnote. Afflictions or hardships. Back to the verse. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, check the footnote, competes in an athletic contest, back to the verse, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Notice the insights. A good soldier dutifully endures hardships and sets aside other affairs to please his or her superior. An athlete can be victorious only if he or she obeys the rules. A farmer must work hard to enjoy the fruits of his or her labors. Contemplate how each of these metaphors relates to us in remaining strong in our faith. I think about how a good soldier recognizes that he is part of a work so much bigger than himself and that his life should be in service to it. An athlete is such a good parallel to a disciple of Christ. We can't do whatever we want and expect to be victorious. Athletes must have self-mastery and be dedicated every day to their goal. They push themselves constantly outside of their comfort zone and often to their limits to see what their capacity is and what it can become. Now, I don't know what it is to be a farmer, but I recognize aspects of that great work in my garden. I know what it is to prepare the ground, plant and nourish the seed, and be excited for the potential fruits. But I also know what it is to just throw some seed on the ground and not tend or water the plants or pay attention to the weeds. I know the difference between fruits depending on the gardener's labors. Now, Paul told Timothy he experienced many trials for being a disciple of Christ, as it mentions in verse 9. Let's pick it up in verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes. Here he is referring to the faithful members of the church back to the verse, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, check your footnote, enduring and remaining constant, back to the verse, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So as we endure hardships and remain faithful to the Lord, we can help ourselves and others obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. 
In verses 13 through 19, Paul counseled Timothy to remind the saints to avoid contention and to depart from iniquity, as it mentions in verse 19. Let's take a look at verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Paul used different kinds of vessels or containers as a metaphor for members of the household or church of Jesus Christ. Going on with verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, or becomes thoroughly clean from iniquity, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So if we purge ourselves of iniquity, we can be of better use to the master or the Lord. Going on with verse 22, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Our desire for a pure heart is so important as we preach the gospel or serve in the church. For that, we need to actively flee from youthful lusts. The Institute Manual has this quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley. This is from the April 1997 General Conference. He says, quote, We cannot say it frequently enough. Turn away from youthful lusts. Stay away from drugs. They can absolutely destroy you. Avoid them as you would a terrible disease, for that is what they become. Avoid foul and filthy talk. It can lead to destruction. Be absolutely honest. Dishonesty can corrupt and destroy. Observe the word of wisdom. You cannot smoke. You must not smoke. You must not chew tobacco. You cannot drink liquor. You must rise above these things, which beckon with a seductive call. Close quote. And that brings us to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's start in verse 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Say, we're living in the last days. Have you happened to notice any perils? <laughs> Well, let's see if any of these sound familiar to you. Also, definitely check the footnotes. They will be helpful. Going on with verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, or unloving, truce breakers, false accusers, or slanderers, incontinent, or without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, meaning rash or reckless, high-minded, or puffed up or conceited, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, or weak or gullible women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I love that last verse. Wow, do any of these sound familiar? Have you been affected by or tempted by any of these perils? Verse 5 has great counsel for each of us, from such turn away. The seminary manual has a quote from Elder Neil L. Anderson he says, quote, We live in very interesting times, yet marvelous times. We know as we approach the second coming of the Savior that our world will be full of commotion and confusion. Many in society will disregard the commandments of God. I have often quoted this statement by President Thomas S. Monson, where once the standards of the church and the standards of society were mostly compatible, now there is a wide chasm between us, and it's growing ever wider. Close quote. This is from a BYU Education Week devotional in August of 2015. And it's such a powerful thought, verse 7. In this the information age, we are ever learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's so descriptive. I love that. And maybe that's because we're not looking in the right places for what we're learning. We're not approaching eternal truths. Where can we come to the knowledge of the truth? Why, the source of truth, of course, our Father in heaven. Right. 
Now, in verses 8 through 11, Paul told Timothy that those who resist the truth will have their foolishness made known. He also wrote of the many perils and persecutions he had endured because of his efforts to live the gospel, but that the Lord had delivered him from all of them, as he mentions in verse 11. Let's pick it up in verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Isn't that interesting? That calls back to what we were just talking about. He's telling Timothy to remember not only the things that he's learned, but who he's learned them from. Not Paul but the Spirit. Right. Let's continue a little bit more from that Elder Neil L. Anderson talk referenced earlier from the BYU Education Week in 2015. He says, quote, As we find our way in a world less attentive to the commandments of God, we will certainly be prayerful, but we need not be overly alarmed. The Lord will bless His saints with the added spiritual power necessary to meet the challenges of our day. Close quote. Now let's take a look at one of the gifts that God has provided to help us through the perils of our day. Verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly finished unto all good works. Have you experienced any of these because you studied the scriptures? Let's look at a list from those verses. Scripture study can help you deepen your faith in Jesus Christ, receive wisdom and instruction in situations you face, understand doctrine or truths of the gospel, correct false ideas or poor habits, and help you become more like Jesus Christ. Can you see why in our day in particular it is so important to study the scriptures daily? Here is one of my favorite quotes on the subject from Elder Richard G. Scott's last General Conference address. He says, quote, We talk to God through prayer. He most often communicates back to us through His written word. To know what the voice of the divine sounds and feels like, read His words. Study the scriptures and ponder them. Make them an integral part of everyday life. If you want your children to recognize, understand, and act on the promptings of the Spirit, you must study the scriptures with them. Don't yield to Satan's lie that you don't have time to study the scriptures. Choose to take time to study them. Feasting on the Word of God each day is more important than sleep, School, work, television shows, video games, or social media. You may need to reorganize your priorities to provide time for the study of the Word of God. If so, do it. There are many prophetic promises of the blessings of daily studying the Scriptures. I add my voice with this promise. As you dedicate time every day, personally and with your family, to the study of God's Word, peace will prevail in your life. That peace won't come from the outside world. It will come from within your home, from within your family, from within your own heart. It will be a gift of the Spirit. It will radiate out from you to influence others in the world around you. You will be doing something very significant to add to the cumulative peace in the world. I do not declare that your life will cease to have challenges. Challenges are an important part of mortality. Through daily, consistent scripture study, you will find peace in the turmoil around you and strength to resist temptations. You will develop strong faith in the grace of God and know that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all will be made right according to God's timing, close quote. This is from a talk called Make the Exercise of Faith Your First Priority, and it's from the October 2014 General Conference. I love this talk. Yeah, and we here at Scripture Gems 
totally support this message. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love that promise so much and can testify that it's true. Joyful scripture study has brought so much peace and strength to me and my family. And me too. Now, that doesn't mean that all of our kids are going to choose things the way we want them to choose them, but it doesn't change the fact of the peace and strength that comes. And that brings us to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's start in verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, or check your footnote, urgent or earnest, in season. Going to the Joseph Smith translation, those who are out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers. The English Standard Version says, Accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Back to the verse. Having itching ears. The English Standard Version commentary tells us that that means the people yearn for novelty. Going on with verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Or check your footnote, fulfill your ministry. Notice in verses 3 and 4 that Paul recorded a description of the apostasy that was beginning to happen in the church. Behaviors like those Paul described led to the great apostasy, which made a restoration of the gospel necessary. Let's go on with verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So why might fighting a good fight and finishing the course or a race be effective comparisons to keeping our faith in Jesus Christ throughout our lives? Yes, a boxing match or race require constant endurance, but you also know that there will be an end and that the prize is worth enduring for. Let's go on in verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. The Institute Manual adds, continuing with his metaphor comparing himself to a triumphant athlete, Paul spoke about the crown of righteousness that was laid up for him, a reference to the crowns of olive branches that were given to the victors in ancient Greek athletic contests. Paul then pointed out that an eternal crown will be given to all saints who righteously endure to the end and prepare for the second coming of the Lord. Paul testified that throughout his persecution, the Lord stood with him and strengthened him as he preached the gospel. I love this metaphor. I love movies, and I was thinking of showing a clip here from a favorite film of mine, Chariots of Fire. It's based on a true story of certain British runners preparing for and participating in the 1924 Olympic Games. One is a Christian missionary, Eric Little. In one of his races leading up to the Olympics, he gets knocked down, putting him way behind the others. What happens next is miraculous. I was going to show you that clip, but the most amazing example of this same situation, the miraculous finishing of a race, was available instead. In July of 2023, Kenneth Rooks of BYU competed for the steeplechase national title. While you're watching this, think about what Paul is teaching. The announcers were not talking about Kenneth Rooks as the race began. Although on the inside, Kenneth soon found himself from third place to the middle of the pack. Kenneth was being boxed in and couldn't clear the barrier. He was down. 
everyone thought that for him, the race was over. With less than six laps to go, no one thought to pay attention to Rooks. But before anyone knew it, he was in the pack and moving to the front. In the last lap, Kenneth unleashed the power that was in him. Wow, what a story this is! From falling to the finish! Actually, interestingly, I actually, before the race, that's a scenario I went through if I fell. Wow, you went what through was, that. What, what would I do? Incredible. And uh, I was like, okay, if I fall, just got to get back up, work my way back up slowly. If I get up close to the pack, I'm feeling good. We'll see what happens. And what happened was you won a national championship off the fall. Congratulations. What a recovery. Isn't that an amazing story? That is awesome. I love it. I think that's what it means to fight the good fight and to finish the course. So inspiring. The seminary manual includes this quote from Elder L. Tom Perry from the April 2008 General Conference. He says, quote, Enduring to the end requires faithfulness to the end, as in the case of Paul. Obviously, this is not an easy task. It is intended to be difficult, challenging, and ultimately refining as we prepare to return to live with our Father in heaven and receive eternal blessings. Enduring to the end is definitely not a do-it-yourself project. It requires the Savior's redemptive power, end quote. Fantastic. Now, in verses 9 through 22, Paul concluded his letter by explaining that even though he had felt lonely at times in his work, the Lord was with him and strengthened him. Now, a quick note, there are several names mentioned in that verse block. One of them in particular, in verse 21, is Linus. Fun fact, the character Linus Van Pelt, the blanket-carrying philosopher from the comic series Peanuts, was actually named after this man. Charles Schultz, the creator of the strip, was openly Christian. And the name in this verse just stuck out to him, perhaps like a sore thumb. <laughs> I see what she did there. And that brings us to the Epistle of Paul to Titus. Let us again take our introduction from the 2016 Seminary Manual. It says, This epistle was written by Paul to Titus, whom Paul referred to as mine own son after the common faith. Titus was Greek and had been converted to the gospel by Paul himself. After his conversion, Titus labored with Paul to spread the gospel and organize the church. He helped gather donations for the poor in Jerusalem and also accompanied Paul to the Jerusalem Council. Paul entrusted Titus to take to Corinth Paul's first epistle to the saints living there. Paul wrote to Titus to strengthen him in his assignment to lead and care for the branch of the church in Crete in spite of opposition. It is likely that Paul wrote the epistle to Titus between his writing of 1 and 2 Timothy around AD 64-65. Paul wrote the epistle to Titus after Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. Paul did not indicate where he was when he wrote the epistle to Titus. So let's get started in Titus chapter 1. In the first six verses, Paul testified of the hope he had for eternal life because of God's promises in our premortal existence. The Institute Manual says, in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, Paul spoke of eternal life, which God promised before the world began. This verse, along with other passages in the Bible, attests that we lived before we were born into mortality. Paul also explained that he had sent Titus to the island of Crete to set the church in order there. One duty Titus had was to call men to serve as bishops. You might remember earlier in this episode when we talked about 1 Timothy chapter 3 that it lists the characteristics of a bishop. Let's add these to that list, starting in verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, check your footnote, obstinate or arrogant. Back to the verse. Not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, 
not given to filthy lucre, meaning money that is obtained through dishonest or otherwise unrighteous means. Verse 8. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, a gainsayer is someone who speaks against or denies an idea, in this case, the truthfulness of the gospel. Gainsayers can be both members and non-members of the church. Even though this is referring to bishops, we learn that as we hold fast to the word of God, we will be able to use true doctrine to encourage others to live the gospel of Jesus Christ and to refute those who oppose it. True doctrine is powerful. President Boyd K. Packer famously said in the October 1986 General Conference, quote, True doctrine, understood, changes attitudes and behavior. The study of the doctrines of the gospel will improve behavior quicker than a study of behavior will improve behavior. That is why we stress so forcefully the study of the doctrines of the gospel. Close quote. That's awesome. Now, in the remaining verses, Paul taught Titus that bishops needed to rely on true doctrine because there were many deceivers and false teachers among them. He counseled Titus to rebuke the false teachers so they would forsake their errors and be sound in the faith, as it mentions in verse 13. Paul also explained that those who are defiled profess that they know God but deny Him by their works. But Paul isn't done teaching about true doctrine. Let's take a look at Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, skipping to verse 3, the aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And what about counsel for the men? Let's take a look at that skipped verse, verse 2, that the aged men be sober, meaning calm or serious, grave, temperate, meaning self-controlled, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. And now skipping to verse 6, Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, meaning to be respectful, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Now, if you might be qualified as an aged man or aged woman, is there more you can do to be a good example of someone who lives sound doctrine for the young men and young women around you? They need your loving wisdom, example, and guidance. When it comes to teenagers, you may find that those of you who are not their parents may have the ability to have an influence on youth that parents may no longer have in the same way. Be firm and steadfast in sound doctrine for you and for them. Now, in verses 9 through 10, Paul counseled Titus to teach church members who worked as servants to be honest and agreeable in their dealings with their masters. By being honest and agreeable, these church members would honor the Lord and set a good example for their masters. Let's pick it up in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. So Jesus Christ gave himself for us, so that he could redeem us 
and purify us, a peculiar people, as it mentions in verse 14. This refers to us as the Lord's treasured people whom he has purchased or redeemed and who covenant to keep his commandments. And that brings us to Titus chapter 3. In verses 1 and 2, Paul counseled Titus to teach the saints in Crete to obey the law of the land and to be gentle and meek in all their relationships with others. Let's pick it up in verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Notice how Paul described himself, Timothy, and others before they changed. And what was the cause of that change? Verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And now look for what the atonement of Christ would do for them. Verse 7, That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So, what should we do when we have become disciples of Christ? Be careful to maintain good works. In verses 9 through 15, Paul advised the saints to avoid contending with divisive people. Paul also requested that Titus come visit him in Macedonia. And that brings us to the epistle of Paul to Philemon. Once again, let's get our introduction from the 2016 Seminary Manual. It says, The epistle to Philemon was prepared by Paul during the apostles' first imprisonment in Rome, around A.D. 60-62. This epistle is a private letter about Onesimus, a slave who had robbed his master Philemon and run away to Rome. Philemon was probably a Greek convert and was a resident of Colossae. He allowed a church congregation to meet in his home. After running away, Onesimus joined the church and became a brother beloved in the Lord. Paul wrote to Philemon to encourage him to receive Onesimus back as a brother in the gospel without the severe punishments that would usually be inflicted on runaway slaves. Paul even offered to make up any financial loss Onesimus had caused Philemon to suffer. So let's start in Philemon. In the first three verses, Paul began his epistle by greeting Philemon and others, including the congregation that met in Philemon's home. Let's pick it up in verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication, check the footnote, participation and fellowship, of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Meaning, their hearts had been enlivened by Philemon. The Institute Manual adds, In Philemon verse 7, 12, and 20, the original Greek word translated as bowels referred to one's inner parts, meaning one's feelings and affections. Some modern Bible translators have chosen to translate this word as heart rather than bowels. When Paul spoke of the saint's bowels and his own bowels being refreshed, he was referring to their hearts being comforted and their emotions heightened by others. Right. So let's keep going in verse 8. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin or command thee that which is convenient— meaning proper or fitting, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Meaning that while Paul was in prison, he had helped Onesimus begin a new life as a follower of Jesus Christ. Continuing in verse 11 which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, 
Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. The Institute Manual adds, Paul explained that he had chosen not to use his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ to demand that Philemon do that which is convenient, to receive Onesimus back. Instead, Paul simply requested that Philemon honor his wishes because of Paul's advanced age and his suffering as a prisoner. Paul's use of the word convenient hints that Philemon should forgive Onesimus because it was the most fitting or becoming thing for a true follower of Christ to come up to. Now, in verses 13 and 14, Paul wanted to keep Onesimus with him so that Onesimus could assist him, but Paul did not want to do so without Philemon's consent. Let's pick it up in verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Can you imagine that viewing Onesimus as a brother beloved might have been difficult for Philemon? They belonged to different social and economic classes, and Onesimus may have wronged Philemon according to the customs of the day. The reference in verse 16 to Onesimus as a servant means that he was a slave. The Institute Manual tells us, Under Roman practices of the time, slaves were at the mercy of their owners. Runaway slaves who were recovered were sometimes branded on the forehead, severely beaten, sent away to perform hard menial tasks, thrown into amphitheaters with dangerous beasts, and in extreme cases, killed. When Paul requested that Philemon receive Onesimus back not as a servant, but as a beloved brother, he was asking Philemon not to inflict on Onesimus the customary punishment of a runaway slave. We are all spirit children of Heavenly Father, and thus are all brothers and sisters. In addition, through the ordinances of baptism and confirmation, the continual exercise of faith in Jesus Christ, obedience, and consistent repentance, we are spiritually reborn. In this way, we become sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, and therefore brothers and sisters in His covenant family. Regardless of our gender, age, background, or social status, we become equal in God's kingdom. Let's go on with verse 17. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. You know, extending mercy and forgiveness to those who have wronged us does not necessarily mean allowing them to avoid the consequences of their actions, nor does it mean immediately restoring our trust in them. Instead, it means that we show compassion toward others and let go of any resentment, anger, or hurt that we may be harboring. When appropriate, we may also allow those who have wronged us to regain our trust. Although forgiving others may be difficult, we can pray to Heavenly Father for help, and He will help us. I testify that that is true. Let's finish up the epistle, verse 18. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Notice how Paul offered to repay Philemon for any financial loss Philemon had suffered as a result of Onesimus' actions. That was a very Christ-like thing to do. Just as Paul interceded on Onesimus' behalf, Jesus Christ intercedes on our behalf and pleads our cause before Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ has also paid the spiritual debt we owe for our sins. Consider times when you were like Philemon, needing to extend mercy and forgiveness to someone else. How did you do it, and how were you blessed by it? When have you, like Onesimus, hoped to receive mercy and forgiveness from another person? When have you, like Paul, served as a mediator between someone who was seeking forgiveness and the person who needed to extend forgiveness and mercy? How did your faith in Christ help you? Remember that Jesus Christ is always the answer. He gives us strength to forgive, to be peacemakers, 
It is through him that we can be forgiven. Give yourselves over to him. Well, what an amazing amount of gems we covered in this episode. Four epistles rich with things to pick out and cherish and share with family and friends. Great teachings, incredible testimony, challenging situations that we can apply the gospel and principles of Jesus Christ to. I hope that you discovered some wonderful and applicable things. Well, we're not quite through with the epistles of Paul. We have one more yet to study over the next two lessons. So keep reading your scriptures, and we'll talk to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans.